Okay. Well, welcome, folks. As you're joining, we'll um, we'll get started here in a couple, just a minute or two. Okay, we're very happy to have you all joining us this evening. Uh, we're just going to give people another minute or two to, to uh, join on and we'll get started. Okay, we have wonderful participation tonight and a lot of interest in this topic. We're going to give people just another minute to join us and get started. Okay. Well, we've reached close to 150 people joining us, and I have a feeling that uh, more will be joining us in a bit. But uh, thank you so much for being with us tonight, a part of this webinar, uh, Landscaping with Native Plants, Cost Savings, and More to Dig. There's lots to dig about native plants. Um, I'm learning about them, and I'm sure some of you will be learning, and some of you will have quite a bit of information already. Um, but I'm Sam Carpenter. I'm Executive Director with the Hoosier Environmental Council. Um, I'm joined here tonight by Liz Mazur. Uh, Liz is a retired teacher and newly elected a f uh, member of the City of Lawrence Common Council. Uh, Liz is really motivated to uh, share the benefits of native planning and encouraging it uh, among individuals, homeowners associations, um, and local governments to consider native planting in their landscaping. We're joined also tonight uh, by Jenny Jenkins. Uh, Jenny is a staff member of Hoosier Environmental Council, and she's our senior special projects manager, uh, but also has a lot of experience with uh, uh, landscaping with native plants and, and says that she's been to uh, seven or eight years of the uh, uh, native plant uh, uh, conference. Uh, so quite a bit of experience there. Uh, Emily uh, Plunkett is our manager of outreach and she's here working with us behind the scenes to help everything keeping uh, run smoothly. Um, wonderful. We have uh, well over 150 people here joining us tonight. So uh, there's been a lot of interest in this topic. Just a little bit about Hoosier Environmental Council. Um, we're really working to improve quality of life for all Hoosiers uh, through strong environmental policy and environmental practices. Uh, we're focused on everything from just clean air, clean water, protecting our natural spaces, uh, environmental justice, uh, sustainable development, minimizing the impact of development, um, sustainable agriculture, and really uh, so much more. What I encourage folks to do if you're not that familiar is, or if you haven't done so, that I hope you'll visit our website, uh, get to know us a little bit, um, and, and learn more about the Hoosier Environmental Council and what we're about. Um, already this year, we've been uh, featured or mentioned in uh, 35 news media articles. Um, in the last few months, we've had uh, 4,500 uh, actions that we've um, are have led to um, uh, people taking action in terms of emailing their legislators or making phone calls or signing a petition uh, in advocating for on environmental issues. Uh, we've had well over a thousand registrants for different webinars that we've put on, um, as well as a great uh, turnout interest in this one. So we're really advocating. Uh, for Indiana's environment, and very proud of what we've been able to accomplish this way. Um, tonight, um, we're especially be excited to be talking about 
native plants um, and their benefits and why they're important. Um, we got so much response and uh, questions um, from this particular um, event. And I apologize, I've got like the sun coming down at different angles with me tonight. Uh, but we have had so much that we're actually planning to do some additional webinars. Um, we have a tentative date anyways of April 24th. We hope to uh, partner, uh, planning to partner with the Native Plant Society to really do a lot of information about what to plant, how to plant, uh, where to get your plants, um, and some of that really kind of hands-on knowledge. Uh, they're a great resource. Um, in addition, on uh, May 29th, we're going to be um, offering a webinar about how to get um, your city ordinances um, and support that effort so that native plant um, planting will be, uh, you know, enabled more broadly in your community, encouraged more broadly in your community. Um, so we're really excited about that. We're also looking at a webinar on uh, sustainable development. There's a lot of a mix between native planting and sustainable development. So we encourage that you'll receive emails about that, but we encourage you to be, um, you know, checking your emails and, and, and looking out for those additional uh, things. So stay tuned on that. Um, one thing I want to do is thank our green businesses tonight. Um, we have a number of businesses that have demonstrated their own commitment to environmental uh, sustainability, and they are supporters of Hoosier Environmental Council as well. Um, we are supported through a number of resources. Green businesses is one small part. Uh, a big part of how we're supported is through uh, individual giving. And again, I what I hope you'll do is you'll uh, get to know us a little bit, uh, get involved, um, get on our, our email list, and um, and then if you're supporting what we do, maybe in the future, consider uh, making a contribution. Uh, but we do rely on individual support as well. Um, one thing, uh, thanks for that uh, green business. We can bring that back down. Um, one thing that we're gonna do tonight is we're going to drop a uh, survey into our chat. We would really appreciate it if you would take the time to complete that survey. It's just like four or five questions. It's pretty quick. Um, so we encourage you to take that survey and give us your feedback because it's very valuable for us in terms of learning more about you know, the things that are interested and how we can uh, be most effective in how we're doing these, um, these webinars. Um, so again, oh, also tonight, um, there is going to be a question and answer period. Now, we've received so many questions um, in advance of this webinar, which we really appreciate. And uh, we've taken a lot of time to try to answer some of those questions. Um, we're going to put a resource um, into the uh, chat for you to link. And we'll also be sending that out by email. But it has a lot of resources about you know, where to get native plants um, and more of the practical things about um, how to plant and, and managing them. Uh, we'll try to answer some of those questions tonight too, and we'll answer as many questions as we can tonight. Uh, but put your questions into the Q&A. Um, that's where we'll be looking for them as well as we have some uh, questions that you've sent in before, and we're gonna be answering those for you. Um, so again, um, Thank you for joining us. I'm super excited about this. I know I'm going to learn a lot. Um, and now I'm going to hand it over to Liz, who's going to start off uh, sharing for us. Hello, everyone. And I want to say right off the bat that people always say they're not going to read their parent. PowerPoint, and then they do, and I will be reading the PowerPoints, just so you're aware of that. So the first slide is how sustainable native pollinator-friendly plantings can benefit businesses, government facilities, and homeowners. They reduce landscaping costs, help the environment, improve residents' health, and beautify. 
Next slide, please. So here you have this huge expanse of turf grass. And in America, uh, many of us think that this is a beautiful green space, that this is what we want, this uh, lush manicured spread of grass. And don't get me wrong, we do need some turf grass. We want a place where we can throw a ball for our dog, um, take our kids um, out to play some soccer and, um, you know, on a sunny day, put out a blanket and um, enjoy the sun. But we have over 20 million acres of turf grass in this country. And we really don't need that much. This turf grass is a monoculture or green desert. It doesn't provide any habitat. Um, it looks like a green space. And now at the, you'll see the word robins and you're probably going, how does that fit in? Well, uh, a friend was talking to me and saying, well, I always see robins on these green spaces, uh, these big expanses of grass, they've got to be good. And uh, Several weeks ago, I was looking in my backyard. We have some turf grass, and we also have some woods with lots of leaves that have fallen. And there are about 12 robins out there. And I realized that 10 of those 12 robins were back in the woods, digging around in the leaves, looking for insects and worms. So that green space is not as green as we think it is. If robins have a choice, they'll go elsewhere. Moving on to the next slide, please. So we're gonna be discussing different things um, related to pollinators. And the first thing is economic, pollinator-friendly plantings. The first one is economic reasons to reduce, replace turf grass and install native pollinator-friendly plantings. Natural landscaping provides multiple environmental and economic benefits which accrue over time. Complex and expensive watering systems as seen in this photo are not necessary. Similarly, mowing costs and the use of fertilizers and herbicides are vastly reduced or eliminated. Resources are saved and costs are reduced. Next slide, please. Here is a graph showing uh, the, how beneficial it is to your pocketbook to plant natives. Now, green is grass and orange is native plants. And this is money for natives and grass over four, five years. Now, you'll look at the first, the we are, where you have it's comparable if you plant grass seed or you plant pollinator friendly seeds, it's comparable. Actually, the pollinator seeds will probably cost a little more. But then you go to the next year and you'll see that you are spending more on the grass taking care of it versus the orange native pollinator friendly plantings. And a lot of that is because you are mowing your grass 20 to 30 times a year and that adds up. Uh, if you have an acre of grass, that's $1,000 a year, if not more, that you're spending. Whereas with the natives, once they're planted, you just mow them twice a year and you don't need to water them. You don't need to use chemicals on them. So in the long run, they cost much less. So you keep on going down and you get to the fifth year. And by that fifth year, you are spending less than half on the native pollinator friendly plantings than you would on turf grass. So next slide, please. So I wanna be upfront about where data comes for this presentation. And the graph on the previous slide was created from data in figure four, page six of the October 27th, 2020 publication by the Center for Rural Affairs. And this is about, um, this was about uh, solar farms and how it is just so much cheaper for them to plant natives than to plant grass. So it was really good source, actually provided by the Hoosier, Hoosier Environmental Council. Thank you. Next slide, please. 
So um, I'm hitting you over the head with this, but grass, turf costs a lot because you have mowers, gas, manpower, fertilizers, pesticides, and time. You can save money by planting pollinator friendly plantings. Next slide, please. We're moving on now to health reasons to reduce, replace turf grass with native pollinator friendly plantings. There is a growing scientific body of evidence that commonly used lawn care products are not as harmless as we thought. EPA, Environmental Protection Agency registration, does not necessarily mean products are safe. There's a loophole. A product which is registered hasn't necessarily been tested. So Dow, Monsanto, Bayer, uh, that bag of fertilizer that you get from the local hardware store, it may say that the product has been registered with the EPA, but that does not mean it's been tested, and that's concerning. Next slide, please. The American Academy of Pediatrics has stated children's exposure to pesticides should be limited as much as possible. Next slide. 40% of the chemicals used by the lawn care industry are banned in other countries because they are carcinogens. And 40 to 60% of the fertilizer applied to lawns ends up in surface and groundwater where it kills aquatic organisms and contaminates drinking water. And this is from page 48 of Nature's Best Hope by Douglas Ptolemy. You'll be... Uh, hearing more about Douglas Ptolemy if you're not already familiar with him. Thank you. Next slide. Um, another article, and this is from Indianapolis, so it really hits home. Uh, this is by Sherry Rudovesky in the Indianapolis Star, titled, Indiana Doctor Study Links Herbicide to preterm births. Franciscan Health Indianapolis Dr. Paul Winchester long wondered why doctors had been seeing more babies born prematurely. He published an article in the journal Environmental Health about how pregnant women whose urine contained higher levels of the chemical commonly, commonly used in herbicides were most likely to deliver low birth weight babies, which often have a lot of problems. And then it continues. One of the most common herbicides, glyphosate, is found in more than 750 products, including the popular weed killer Roundup, the study says. He concedes that not every scientist even agrees that glyphosate poses a danger to human health, but also states we don't have a chemical regulation system that's weighted toward the safety of the public, and it's weighted heavily toward the success of chemical companies. So I do um, here want to talk about how when I was a kid 50 years ago, 75% of the population smoked cigarettes. Mom smoked cigarettes, dads, doctors. A lot of people smoke cigarettes and the tobacco industry advertised that there was nothing wrong, that smoking was perfectly acceptable. The thing is, is that the tobacco industry did know that there were issues with tobacco and your health, um, that your lungs could be harmed by it, but they kept that information um, hidden and they spent a lot of money and lobbying and advertising, persuading people that cigarette smoking was just fine. And that's very similar to what's going on with the lawn care industry and landscaping pro care products because these products make a lot of money and um, the people are making the money. You can't blame them. They want to continue, but uh, that's concerning for our health and the health of the planet. Next slide, please. Well, here we have another, this is from the EPA too, um, but it states that an average of one out of every 10 school-aged children has asthma. My eldest daughter had asthma, and it was pretty scary. It's, it's not um, pleasant at all. And if we can do something to reduce asthma, let's do it. So let's go to the next slide, please. 
5% of the air pollution in the United States is from gas mowers. If we reduce the amount of mowing, we can reduce air pollution, which exacerbates asthma in our kids. We can think globally and act locally. We can be sustainable. And if we reduce the turf grass that we have, we can reduce the air pollution, which causes um, uh, aggravates asthma in our kids. Next slide, please. This is for all you folks who have dogs and care about them. And dogs, as we all know, are close to the grass. So this is concerning. Many herbicides, with one in particular containing 2,4-D, an ingredient in Agent Orange, are linked to at least two kinds of cancer in dogs. And if you're using a professional lawn service, a company with access to chemicals and compounds not available to regular homeowners, the risk is elevated. So the, these products, their concerns about them harming kids, dogs, it's, it's an issue with turf grass and the products used to keep our turf grass uh, as lush and green as uh, our society has come to think grass is supposed to be. Next slide, please. We're moving on now. So this is global sustainability reasons why native pollinator friendly plantings are a sensible and viable alternative to turf grass, our food supply and survival of pollinators. Liz, I wonder if I could ask you a question. Certainly. Um, <clears throat> so you're talking to people about pollinators and the benefits and, and native planting. Um, how receptive or do you find people to this uh, message and and uh, understanding the benefits that come with that? I think many people are not aware that turf grass doesn't provide much habitat. They think that it's green and it's uh, attractive and don't recognize that there are issues with it and that there's a whole new world out there of pollinator friendly plantings that can um, be beautiful and that are different from grass. And um, it's just, we, we have, we accept that grass is what you do in your yard. Is that answering your question, Sam? That is. And so you, so that's people get introduced to this and then they find that they're able to, um, do you find that some people are picking this up and, uh, and trying native plants? I find that I talk to people and they tell me they just start seeing places where native plants could be instead mm -hmm. of big expanses of grass. They go, whoa, we could have um, a field of pollinator friendly plantings there or, hey, why not put a little pocket garden in there? Why, why does the grass need to be there? We, we could have coneflowers and um, some milkweed and um, they start looking at the world in a different way, not just seeing big expanses of green. Wonderful. Thank you. And I'm sorry to interrupt. I'll, I'll save my other questions till uh, you're through with your part. Oh, my husband is here. He's inserting something. There are uh, questions that are coming through. So maybe you want to answer this one. We have a grassy hillside. How can we convert that to natives? Or will you answer that later? We will be answering um, specifics like that, which is a great question at the next webinar when we will have presenters about what would be the best place. But um, that's great for erosion purposes and because it's it can be dangerous mowing on an incline. So planting natives is a great idea um, instead of just having grass there. So... Um, Great. Well, would you like you. more questions or no, should we go continue? For it, go for it. Go through, go on with, and we'll pick up others in the, toward the end. Thank you. Okay. So this slide here, you see these oranges. Um, more than a third of the food we eat is reliant on pollinators. No pollinators, no oranges. And pollinator habitat is disappearing. We can help by planting native flowers, which helps us by helping our food supply. Next slide, please. 
Another thing to think about is here we live in Indiana and we are right in the fly zone as those monarch butterflies, which most of you are familiar with, are moving, migrating from Canada, migrating from Mexico up to Canada and then back again over several generations. And um, the monarch butterfly population is much less than it was because while the butterflies are traveling, they don't have the milkweed, they don't have the nectar flowers that they need. And um, because of um, chemicals uh, loss, impacting uh, native flowers and urbanization, destruction of their habitat. So we want to think of the monarch butterfly as kind of a canary in a coal mine. If they're not doing well, uh, other insects aren't doing well, and that uh, impacts us all. And we want, um, let's make Indiana be a monarch destination and plant pollinator friendly plants and milkweed. So we'll have lots of them. It's a win-win. Next slide, please. We need pollinators and pollinators need native pollinator friendly plantings. Turf grass doesn't provide the habitat. And this is an image of common milkweed and uh, a monarch butterfly. And um, pretty beautiful and pretty important. Next slide, please. Monarch butterfly populations have plummeted due to the decimation of milkweed, the only plant monarch caterpillars can eat. Um, no milkweed, no monarchs, which would be pretty sad. Um, my husband's interrupting again. Yes, dear husband. One of your uh, viewers wants to have a list of native plants so they can plant them. We will get to that for sure. We, we can do that. So next slide, please. Here we have Nature's Best Hope. Um, we've already mentioned Douglas Tallamy, and this is his book. Um, and it is about the homegrown national park. And the whole concept of this is that we have national parks and we have state parks, and that's wonderful. They provide a lot of habitat for insects and for birds and for other animals, but we have 20 million acres of grass, of turf grass in this country. And even though, for example, uh, Fort Benjamin Harrison State Park is near here, it is not enough habitat if all of us individual homeowners and businesses and governments could replace some of our turf grass with some pollinator friendly plantings, we could have a homegrown national park that could make a huge difference uh, and help these pollinators. And so we need to start thinking about participating in this homegrown national park because we don't have enough habitat. Uh, next slide, please. Why native plants instead of introduced plants? As mentioned, milkweed is the only source of food for endangered monarch butterfly caterpillars. Natives are hardier and need less maintenance and water once established. Natives have adapted without pesticides and fertilizers, making those pollutants unnecessary. Natives interact healthily with local insects and animals. And I do wanna emphasize here that when you are growing natives, you wanna make sure that you are uh, growing native flowers and grasses to your area. Uh, we live here in Indiana. Do not bring natives from California here, please. There's been an issue with people bringing up tropical milkweed from Florida where it's a native up north and the tropical milkweed blooms later in the year and it uh, messes up the migration of the monarch butterflies because they stick around eating, getting the um, tropical milkweed, and then they leave too late to return to Mexico to migrate. So really, natives that are native to your area. Thank you. Next slide. Hmm. I am 
a little puzzled. I think we should have some more slides on here. Let's see. Um, oh, yeah, here we are. Okay. Other reasons to reduce replace turf grass with native pollinator friendly plantings, Canada geese, baby birds. So next slide, please. Canada geese love short turf grass. Native flowers deter them. They think that they're predators in taller grass or taller native pollinator friendly plantings. And so they will relocate if they don't have that turf grass. And then you won't have all that um, Canada goose poop around. So another benefit to natives. Next slide, please. Uh, according to that Douglas Ptolemy, a professor of entomology and wildlife ecology at the University of Delaware, a single pair of breeding chickadees must find 6,000 to 9,000 caterpillars to rear one clutch of young. If all that's around is expanses of grass, the uh, green deserts, the monocultures, these birds are going to starve. They, they need native habitat so that pollinators, which they dine upon, can um, feed those baby birds. So don't starve baby birds, plant native pollinator friendly plantings. Next slide, please. Are native pollinator friendly plantings the only choice for replacing, reducing turf grass? No, there's some other things you can do. For example, next slide. You sustainable options include low mow areas. These sections are mowed once or twice a year. I live in Kensington Farms and we have 15 acres of turf grass and we have planted some native pollinator friendly areas here, but we've also started having some low mow areas. At first, the neighbors were pretty resistant, but um, they recognize that uh, just mowing those areas once or twice a year uh, saves on the gas and the pollution, and it actually looks pretty attractive. And I do want to add that I have snuck in and planted some cone flowers and milkweed there. So in the future, perhaps it won't just be tall turf grass. There will be some natives, but uh, it's still you are helping the environment if you're just having some low mow areas too. And then next slide, please. So um, this is an example of how you can have some natives. Ideally, this will be Kensington Farms in the future, that picture on the left with natives. And instead of having that big expanse of monoculture turf, you still would keep the grass next to the road so that dogs can do their business as they're being walked along. But, um, and you don't, as I said, you don't need to get rid of all the turf grass, but um, those uh, natives look pretty attractive and they, uh, let's do them. Next slide, please. So I said, another thing you need to do, you don't have to have turf grass everywhere, is you can have pocket gardens, these little areas. And we have lots of these. Uh, we are changing some of our gardens here in Kensington Farms. This area here, uh, it, uh, we planted seeds in it uh, December 2021. And the following spring, nine months later, next slide. Uh, nine months later, we've got cone flowers over there, and um, uh, in the back there are some daylilies, which are exotics, but they the rest are natives that are flourishing partridge prairie partridge peas and the um, cone flowers and the Black-eyed Susans, and uh, in the past, added to it with some senna the following year, and milkweed and swamp milkweed. So you can have uh, lomo areas. You can have some sections of 
prairie plantings, and you can have these little sections of turf garden of um, just little, no just little areas that you plant. And so there are lots of different ways that you can uh, reduce turf grass, improve your health, help the environment. And uh, these are just some reasons why you should do that. And if I'm correct, this is the last slide. Can we check and make sure, please? Yes. So here's where um, the opportunity questions, concerns about this presentation. Um, and if I've, it's been my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you so much, Liz. Thanks for uh, your interest in this and gathering information. Um, and I, I do want to put a couple of questions out there. I, I saw, I, I think there's some, uh, you've got some folks from Lawrence here. There are a couple of questions Lawrence focused. One was about updating their weed ordinance to al allow native planting. Are you aware of, of something around that and how ordinances can affect uh, the ability to do native planting? That is an excellent um, concern. So the city of Lawrence, its ordinance, um, the pers the group that needs to be uh, contacted if there are issues is Purdue Extension. And Purdue Extension uh, has best practices about planting natives, for example, having buffer zones around ponds um, because that reduces the pollution uh, from runoff into the ponds. And it also, as I said, keeps the Canada geese away and helps with erosion. And if the city of Lawrence um, kind of goes back and looks at the best practices that Purdue Extension recommends, there are lots of ways that pollinator friendly plantings can be encouraged. And also people can um, contact the city of Indianapolis and have a plant registry. Um, Brenda Howard at Indy.gov is with the city of Indianapolis, but people here in Lawrence they can contact her and she can help guide people to have native pollinator friendly plantings and get them registered and make sure that those gardens, those natives that have been established will not be considered um, as quote unquote weeds and mowed down by people who don't recognize that they really are natives and not just someone letting their yard get out of control. Is that answering that question? Wonderful, thank you. Yeah, and um, another person put in here about being a teacher in Lawrence and seeing these big, large tracts of land with the schools. Um, and the thing that I would just add in there on, on, regarding that question is that, you know, our advocacy makes a difference. Uh, education makes a difference, and that's where um, as you have resources, and we're going to drop, uh, maybe we could go ahead and do that, put a drop the uh, resource document into the chat, um, that um, when we do that, that type of advocacy, then it opens that up more. Um, Indian Native Plant Society is a great resource for a lot of information. I know we've got a lot of other questions. We do want to get to the other part of our presentation and invite uh, Jenny to come on. Um, and then we will take some additional questions uh, at the end as well. So again, hang with us uh, and um, we'll try to answer some more of your questions and also we'll have the survey um, as a follow-up. So thank you so much, Liz. My pleasure. What's your nursery that you put in? What's the name Native there? Plants Unlimited. In Geist. Okay, so can you see my screen okay? We can, thank you. Good, excellent, okay. Okay, so hopefully after Liz's presentation, you're beginning to see the benefits of native plants over lawns. Um, but maybe despite these benefits, you're still feeling a little bit hesitant to make a change because after all, our lawns are status symbols, right? They're the ultimate symbol of the American dream, and the idea of lawns has been passed down for generations. 
But what if I told you that lawns are actually not American? That's right. Lawns are not an American invention at all. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that shortly. But in the meantime, I will give you a hint as to what country our American lawns actually originated from. So if you really want to go back to our American roots, honoring what nature or planet Earth or God or whatever you believe in intended to be growing all around us in the first place, you don't land on turf grass. You land on native plants. Because after all, they are the species that are naturally found in a particular region and that are meant to be there. For thousands of years, they've adapted to the climate, they've adapted to the soil, they've adapted to the water conditions of their native environment, and we are all, they're all well suited to grow in these conditions specifically. <clears throat> so speaking of roots, let's take a closer look at what's happening underground in the root systems of native plants. It's something we don't usually see and probably don't give much thought to, but we should because it's really where a lot of the magic happens, especially when it comes to native plants and water. So here is an illustration of some common species of plants native to our area and the root systems. Many of them extend all the way down to eight feet. Uh, over on the left where the green circle is, you might be able to see that tiny little corner. That's turf grass. And if you really, really zoom in, you might be able to make out how long the roots are on that. So when you compare those, it's a really big difference. Um, the root systems in native plants versus turf grass makes all of the difference in the issues that we're talking about here. So here's another illustration, the same idea, some native plants and non-native plants. There's also some turf grass shown in there, but you may be thinking, well, I have daylilies. That's not turf grass, but still not the same. Native plants have extensive root systems. Remember, they go up sometimes up to eight feet, even longer. Um, and that's a big reason why there's so many benefits associated with native plants over lawns when it comes to water. So let's talk about the three big water benefits of native plants. Water usage, water filtration, and flooding and drainage when it comes to native plants. So Liz already talked a lot about it. We already know that lawns require a ton of fertilizers and pesticides, usually to keep them nice and green and how your neighbors you know, expect them to look. Um, but they use 10 times the amount of pesticides and fertilizers than farmers do on their crops. Lawns are also maintained by lawnmowers. And did you know that every year more than 17 million gallons of fuel are spilled while we re refill and refuel our lawn and garden equipment? 17 million gallons is more than the oil that the Exxon Valdez spilled one time. And that's happening every single year. So when it comes to water, anywhere from 30 to 60% of urban fresh water is used on lawns. Most of the water is also wasted due to poor timing, poor application, and really well, not well-run irrigation systems. Homes actually with automated irrigation systems use 50% more water than homes that don't. We may have thought it was the opposite. I know I think I did. Um, but if you use an automated irrigation system, you're using 50% more water than your neighbors that don't. So native plants are using significantly less water than lawns. Lawns require up to 80% more water than native the native plants due to their efficient root systems back to the, the previous picture was. As we know, lawns require constant watering, but with native plantings, you'll only need to water them um, a little bit, much less often than lawns, and only for the first two years until they're established. After that, rain takes care of it all. So these deep roots allow native plants to withstand long periods of dry weather, and so they require little to no watering after they're established. Water filtration. So this is another wonderful benefit of native plants over turf grass and lawns um, when it comes to water. We know that we have a lot of pollutants um, out in our environment that come from all corners of the world. So the roots of native plants filter out these contaminants and pollutants that would otherwise go straight into our waterways. Native plants actually trap up to 50% of just the core sediments, many of which are nutrient and pesticide laden. Native plants also filter water by trapping sediments and contaminants, which improves the quality of surface and groundwater. Lawns don't do that. 
they do it very little. Again, if you just look at the comparison in the roots systems, you can tell how much more native plants will do that. So this is an important slide. This is um, thanks to Clear Water Clean Choice or Clean Water Clean Water <laughs> Clear Choices Indiana. Um, it, it's reminding ourselves how important it is to keep this in mind that where our water goes. So just to look closer at the the image, if you can see it, we have rain that comes down that creates runoff from the roofs, which also creates gutter runoff runoffs from the lawn all along it's picking up all those pesticides or pesticides and any kind of chemicals and contaminants that we have in those areas it's then going to the streets the streets as we all know are not clean places and all of that goes directly into it becomes stormwater runoff and goes directly into our local streams and waterways this is the same water that our drinking water comes from uh, it's also the water we will use for recreation like swimming fishing boating so as you can see, native plants will make a big difference in keeping that water filtered and clean. So let's talk about the next topic that would be flooding and drainage. Native plants are like sponges. And you may have heard recently a lot of talk about wetlands and it's the same idea, wetlands and native plants. Wetlands are generally made up of native plants. They truly act like sponges. As you can see in this picture, this is a kind of your typical turf grass lawn. And uh, after a you know, significant rain event or even not so significant rain event, you often see this pooling in, in um, grass lawns because it's just not a good absorbent, it doesn't react, it doesn't act like a sponge like native plants are. Um, native plants will actually slow down stormwater, they reduce the flooding, they assist with drainage, and they absorb, hold, and gradually release the water. Something to think about if you picture clay soil, and again, going back to that image of the different roots, um, the roots of native plants can actually penetrate that clay soil and get all the way down and therefore um, help with the flooding issues, whereas turf grass doesn't even attempt to, to penetrate very far down there. It's only a couple inches worth of root, so it's not penetrating that clay soil, and we all know what happens with water when it's sitting on top of clay soil. It doesn't go anywhere, so... Let's talk about one other big aspect, actually, of flooding and drainage that some of you may have heard about, some of you may have not, um, and it's rain gardens. This is a great um, illustration of rain gardens, and it's probably even a little more technical than um, I would recommend if you were looking into to, um, making one yourself. Just as a side note, there is a great resource in the resource list that we shared already that talks about um, how to how to build a rain garden if this is something you're interested in. Um, so I would definitely recommend looking at that resource list and checking that out. I believe it was from Purdue Extension. Um, but rain gardens, in case you're not familiar with them, they're an additional use of native plants that absorb, ex absorb excessive waters in our landscapes. Um, the above ground stems and leaves of native plants intercept and dissipate the energy of the falling rain. So that helps a lot with flooding. Uh, native plants also hold from anywhere from 50 to 97 percent of the rain that falls, keeping it from impacting the soil and reducing erosion. So accumulated leaf and stem material also protects the surface as well. That's something that I think we don't think about a whole lot. That's obviously not the roots. It's above ground, but that that helps protect the soil and keeps that, that valuable topsoil from just being washed away. Um, just as a definition, in case you aren't familiar, rain, rain gardens are generally shallow depressions in a yard. They're stocked with native plants and designed to capture and infiltrate uh, stormwater, keeping it from running off the property and polluting the waterways. So um, native plants generally that they are used in the rain gardens are generally picked specifically because they are very tolerant of both wet conditions and or drought. So th they handle it well. And if you design and build these correctly, um, they don't ever hold water long enough for, uh, for it to become a breeding ground for mosquitoes. So that's not something you have to worry about. So again, I highly recommend checking out that article that is in um, the resource list that we're sharing. So Sorry, I'm just, <laughs> let me see where I am. Okay, so um, in conclusion on, on these issues, let's think about some of the recent severe weather we've had and the horror stories that are starting to come um, from the Western United States that we've been hearing for a few years now regarding droughts and fighting over water rights. We know that eventually those same stories are going to make their way to the Midwest. In fact, they're starting to already. So keep that in mind as you look at your lawn and you think about whether your lawn is really the best option for you. This isn't about being a trendsetter or a change maker in the community. This is about um, doing something that's not actually a new thing at all. 
It may seem like the American lawn has been around forever, but it's actually very tired and a very outdated trend. Lawns are the bell bottoms of the American landscape. Let's be honest. Manicured lawns became fashionable in the United States many, many years ago when European settlers came over and they imported the, the manicured lawn from, you guessed it, France. So lawns aren't so American after all. And that will conclude. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jenny. I love it. Lawns are the <laughs> bell bottoms. Um, so uh, if you look into, if you click on the Q&A, you'll see a number of answered questions um, in there. So if you haven't looked into the Q&A, you can look in there and see a number of answered questions. Um, Jenny, it's interesting you're talking about this runoff, um, the amount of fertilizer put onto our, our lawns and the um, shallow root system. Um, in the Gulf of Mexico, there's a huge algae bloom. Um, and we what we have is a, a lot of nitrates, a lot of fertilizer um, goes into our waterways. Um, and what we put on our lawn, because, you know, it's not going to hold, it's not going to retain that rainwater in this uh, extra, you know, fertilizers being put on. What's happening is it's getting, you know, led into our, our rivers and streams. It's taken down um, to the Gulf of Mexico, and we have this huge algae bloom. We also have issues with algae in a, in a lot of our lakes uh, and rivers. Um, and so there's some real benefits to... Um, going with uh, natives that require less um, or don't really require the fertilizer or pesticides. Um, also, you know, Liz um, touched on some things of, from Doug uh, Talame, if I'm saying that right. Um, and he really talks about the biodiversity that comes with this uh, type of native planting. Um, so a lot of great things there. Um, one thing I wanted to ask, um, let's see here, is there a time of year when it's useful or not harmful to trim down like dead native plants, dead shoots uh, that will reflower? Um, can you talk a little bit about how you manage those in your own kind of garden? Is that for Jenny or for me? Well, whoever wants to answer it. I'll start off and then you finish up, Jenny, how's that? So, uh, well, for example, uh, the city of Lawrence has close to five acres of pollinator friendly plantings and the director of the parks department, Eric Martin, has done a great job of mowing strips in the fall so that um, there is... Uh, some of the plants are cut down, but then he leaves plants up so, because many solitary bees rest, uh, nest in the stalks of the plants. And also there are lots of insects that, that eat like birds, eat the seeds on the plants and stuff. And then in the spring, um, once it's been over 50 degrees, at least a week um, in the spring, then he's going to mow down the other strips, the strips that were not mowed down in the fall. And that will give the bees and other insects that nested, they will have been able to hatch and fly away. And then that provides a kind of new growth mowing some of that stuff down um in my yard what i do is i leave i cut everything to about three feet uh so that the overwinter the insects can nest and i will leave it alone as much as possible um but if it gets looks too messy i will trim it up and tidy it up so that my husband doesn't get on my case so jenny I agree with all of that. And I I actually, there is an article or there is a uh, resource that I will put into the chat box momentarily. I'm trying to find it a good short article just about um, really 
leaving all of the um, the garden leftovers, so to speak, um, over the winter, but then also leaving them really for as long as you can, if not forever. They make great mulch. They make, um, you know, they do compost and they'll turn right back into excellent soil. So there's really not a reason to um, remove them from your garden. I mean, the whole idea of a garden is kind of that it's a system, right? So if you need to cut them down, that certainly is fair. Um, but there are ways that you can do that and be not be you know harming um, pollinators, the bees, a lot of the good insects that we have. Um, if you pick up everything that is left over after the winter and throw it into a trash bag or you know even better compost pile, you're 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 also picking up a lot of um, butterfly and moth and a, a beneficial insect, you know eggs and and different stages of life and, and throwing them and they will not survive that. So leaving it down is always going to be the best thing. But if you do need to clean it up, and I understand that there's HOAs that might require some of that, um, I will get this link put into the chat momentarily of a, a great article that at least kind of walks you through some of that. Wonderful. Thank you both. Um, I do want to let people know now we do have the survey in the chat. Um, it's just, uh, if you would share your feedback about the webinar, that's uh, super helpful for us. Um, I realize we'll continue to answer some questions, but I realize um, some people might be um, kind of finishing up, but uh, we still have a wonderful group here, over 160 people uh, with us tonight. So wonderful turnout. Um, another question, I guess, is about the um, kind of the, the weed care and maintaining um, in the work involved and, and how to do that. Um, how, how time intensive do you find that to be? And um, how do you kind of maintain a good appearance for your, uh, your garden area? Well, I learned about three years ago about root competition. And that's the idea that when you plant your natives is you plant them very, you throw, put the seeds down and the plants are all very close to each other. And that means that the roots, um, they're competing and they go straight down into the earth. And then the plants are very close to one another. So that keeps them from flopping over. And it also keeps um, weeds, uh, plants that you don't want uh, that you didn't plant, they're not going to get in there because there's so many natives that were planted there originally, and that will reduce the need to uh, pull out plants that you did not intend to go in there. So it reduces the flopping and keeps unwanted plants from growing in there. So that's a strategy that I use. Great, thank you. Um, Jenny, do you want to add to that? Well, actually, if I could mention real quick, I do apologize about this rain garden PDF. I, I'm, I'm seeing that, and I don't know if my messages are now going through to everybody or not. Yes, I think or they are now. Yes, thank you. Okay, excellent. Um, I, I, I'm, it's, I'm stymied by it because it's the same link that I've shared a couple times. And if you do come across other issues in those in the resource list, um, which may happen, I think it may have something to do with the formatting. I'm not quite sure happen. I will get those fixed. So please do check back on it. If you're finding a lot of broken links, those will be fixed um, as quickly as possible. So I do apologize about that. It's okay. Um, and let's see. And actually, and I'm going to just, actually, I'm going to put that one. Um, back into everyone. Okay, there's that link that Jenny's referring to. Um, I, 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 let's see, and again, if people would take the time to do the survey for us. Um, one thing we want to point out, just remind people of the um, resource document. Um, let me make sure that's going out to everyone. Uh, Indiana Native Plant Society, some people have mentioned that in the Q&A as well, is just a great resource. Um, so you can find a lot of information there. There's also going to find a number of links on the, um, on, on the resource document that we shared. 
Um, how about, it, maybe you've touched on this, let's see. What about, uh, I saw a, a question in the Q&A uh, about legislation that incentivized native planting. And I've actually read some about that. And there's also a question about uh, ordinances and um, getting those passed to support native planting. Liz, can you talk about uh, that at all? Well, we, uh, as a member of the Common Council, I'm encouraging the ordinance that we have for the high weeds, um, no, high grass and noxious weeds to be implemented properly, meaning using the best practices as um, uh, promoted by Purdue Extension. So, but I, I know there are places like in Minnesota that has programs where people are um, encouraged and given financial con donations if they will remove some of their turf grass. Out west, there, where there's the zero escaping, um, that there have been communities that have uh, reimburse people for tearing out their lawns and planting native cacti and stuff like that to reduce the water bills. Um, there are places that are, uh, if people chop down their invasive calorie pears, then they are uh, uh, given a native tree uh, to plant to, repl to replace the calorie pear. But it, there needs to there's a lot of work needs to be done and um, changing policies and talking to your government officials about uh, making sure that we are uh, passing laws. For example, there are still um, invasive plants that are sold in uh, stores in Indiana. Um, for example, you can still buy burning bushes, which are get into uh, the forest and just overwhelm native habitat, um, but they're being sold in nurseries. So we need to change laws. We need to change our behavior. We have a lot of work to do. So yeah, I, I admit that I have a lot of work to do. Great. Thank you. Well, we're doing some of it tonight. Um, somebody shared a comment. If you think about it, Mother Nature seems to take care of the native meadows and no one goes out and cleans up the natural areas. Um, good point. Thanks for sharing that. Um, I want to ask, um, we are getting to kind of the end of their session this evening. I want to ask uh, Jenny and Liz each if you have any kind of closing comments for us as we wind things up. I'll jump in that I think so many people, um, for example, the Kiwanis Club in the city of Lawrence was packaging up milkweed seeds and distributing them at the government center in the city of Lawrence and people are coming in and picking them up and planting them. Um, people are interested and the more they want to make a difference. They want to plant pollinators. So we're we're on the right path. So let's keep on doing it. Wonderful. Thank you. I would be remiss if I didn't um, speak just a little bit more about um, Dr. Douglas Tallamy. Um, for those of you on the webinar that um, are into native plants, you are already well aware of them, aware of him. He is a um, entomologist out of the University of Delaware. And I think for me, like many, many people who were um, inspired to really start paying attention to native plants, he is the reason that it happened. He is um, he is the person that when I heard him present really brought it all together for me. And I know that that was a hard thing for me starting off um, being interested in gardening, but not so much in native plants or not really understanding you know, why um, he's excellent at kind of tying everything together so that you understand why planting native is so important and not just, you know, gardening. Um, gardening alone isn't going to do the trick and um, keep, you know, keep everything that we need uh, alive around us uh, alive. So the biodiversity is important and 
he really gets you to think and changes your whole perspective. You start to see um, gardens and landscapes and just the outdoors as kind of a, uh, I heard somebody describe it once as a cafeteria for insects, and that's the way it should be perceived. I know that seems str probably strange to some people who are into traditional gardening, but that is really the purpose of these plants for being there. And that does not mean that we are going to have um, insects, you know, eaten um, ugly plants everywhere. It, it means that the cycle is going to work well and we're going to have beautiful gardens. So um, I highly recommend again on that uh, resource list, there's uh, Doug Tallamy um, videos and his books are listed. And um, please do check them out if you're looking kind of to get past that hump of not, if you don't quite understand why native plants are so important yet, I, I highly recommend that. So. Well, and, and he has something called the, uh, it's kind of like the, the Ooh. backyard natural park or something national park um, program. And somebody asked a question about certifying your neighborhood. Well, they have a program where you can actually put on your, on their website um, where you've done native planting um, and these pollinator gardens and to try to, to begin to show a collection of that through their program. So um, again, uh, Thank you so much to Liz and Jenny for sharing with us tonight. Thanks everybody for being here. We will send out uh, a document with more of the uh, questions and answers. Um, we weren't, uh, I, I see we got to a lot of questions, but I know we didn't get to all of them. Uh, so thanks for your patience on that. Um, again, I'll ask folks, if you go into our chat, you'll see the survey if you uh, fill that out. And look out for uh, future webinars because I know there's a lot of real interest in specifics about plants to plant and how to maintain them. And we are going to work with the uh, Native Indian Native Plant Society on helping to answer some of those questions too. So um, with that, I'll just say thank you and thanks for joining us and uh, have a, have a great can, but, but in real quick, someone yeah. really wants to know the dates of the next two webinars. Can you say them one more time, Sam, please? Sure. Thank you. Um, so we have uh, one uh, scheduled for April 24th, another one for May 29th, and those will likely be in the evenings again. We haven't um, set that up yet, but that's likely what we will do. Right. You will not, you can't register yet, but do keep an eye out and we'll have those, that information up soon. And I, again, I'll repeat real quickly the topics of those. The next one will be the um, it, more of a how to, I guess, with native plants and kind of more site specific questions for all of you who have asked about, you know, recommendations for plants for your yard. That will be a good one for that. And then the following one will be about how to really get some changes made with our um, HOAs and our cities and communities and how to really work on getting policies changed so that we can plant more native plants. Yeah, and like um, Liz said at the beginning, like there's reasons for turf grass and why we enjoy that. Um, but there's just a lot of opportunity with these uh, native plants and, and doing these gardens in terms of the uh, reduction of the pesticides, the uh, nutrients, um, the main, uh, holding rainwater, um, and reducing runoff, um, lowering your costs to maintain. There's so much opportunity with that, and that's what we really want to focus on. So with that, um, we're going to say good night, and uh, thank you, and thank you for joining us, and, and we'll look forward to see, seeing you as part of uh, future webinars. Have a great evening, everybody.